Hello and welcome to National 5 Biology, Unit 2, Kiria 4, Variation and Inheritance. We're still on Unit 2, Multicellular Organisms, and this is Topic 4, Variation and Inheritance. Once again, here is the SQA course specification or managed knowledge section for this topic. So remember, this is all the bits of knowledge and content that you could be tested on in an exam at this level for this topic. As you can see, this is a larger topic and it is really difficult, especially all of the new definitions. So feel free to pause the video at any point or go back and rewatch sections if you need to. As we go through the theory, there'll be some questions after each part so you can be sure you're ready to move on. So our learning intention today is to learn about variation and inheritance. So what we have to be able to do by the end of the lesson is compare discrete and continuous variation, understand various genetic terms, including allele, genotype, phenotype, dominant and recessive, carry out monohybrid crosses from parental generation through to F2, and explain the reasons why predicted phenotype ratios among offspring are not always achieved. So firstly, what is variation? Well, you already know that there are differences between individuals of every species. Think about humans, for example. We all look different from one another. We all have slightly different hair colours, eye colours, heights and weights. Dogs and other species are also the same. There are differences between each individual. These differences are what is known as variation. Now, before we move on, it's really important that you know what is meant by a species. We come back to this later on in Unit 3, but a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Essentially, what this means is if two individuals are members of the same species, they can interbreed together and produce offspring, and those offspring can then go on and have their own offspring. This definition is really important as there are groups of organisms that can interbreed, but then their offspring are infertile and can't have their own offspring. This means that the two individuals were not members of the same species. We see examples of this in things like mules. So mules are a cross between a donkey and a horse, and although donkeys and horses look similar, they are not members of the same species. So when they have offspring, in this case a mule, the mule is infertile and can't have its own offspring. Now, some people get confused about dogs. Dogs are all one species. They are just different breeds, which is why they um, can look quite different to one another. They're all still the same species, which is why you can crossbreed them to get different breeds and mixes of dogs. And those mixed dogs can then also have offspring. So they are still the same species. So variation are these differences between individuals in a species. And this variation exists because of sexual reproduction. Combining genes from two parents through sexual reproduction means that those offspring are different from each other. They have show variation. So there are two categories that variation can be split into, discrete and continuous variation. You need to know what these are and be able to give examples. You should also be able to take any example given in an assessment and put it into one of these categories. So let's look in more detail at each one, one at a time. So first we're gonna look at discrete variation. So in discrete variation, measurements fall into distinct groups. So if we take tongue rolling ability as an example of a discrete trait, you can either roll your tongue or you can't. Because you either fall into one distinct category or the other, this is a type of discrete variation. Another example of this is blood groups. So you can either be in blood group A, B, AB or O. There are no other options. So because there are distinct categories that measurements fall into, this means that both of these are examples of discrete variation. Other examples include things like earlobes being attached or unattached, or eye colour and fruit flies, which can be either white or red. A simple way to think of this is if you can take the measurement data and put it into a bar graph or a pie chart, so split the measurements easily into distinct groups, then it's a type of discrete variation. All of these examples are results of something called single gene inheritance. So this means that any discrete traits are only controlled by one gene. In comparison, continuous variation is controlled by many genes. In continuous variation, there's a range of values between a minimum and a maximum. For example, if I measured my class's heights, there would be a minimum height and there would be a maximum height. And there would also be a lot of heights in between. These are not easily split into distinct groups and so represent continuous variation. Often continuous traits are represented either by a line graph or a histogram. You need to be careful here though as a lot of people get mixed up between histograms and bar graphs. In this example of height, if you look at it really quickly, you would think this would be a bar graph, so it would be discrete variation. 
But if you look closer, there are ranges of numbers under each bar, not just one number. So this is a histogram, which means that it's continuous. Examples of continuous variation are things like weight, height, and hand span. So usually anything that is a number. Now, I mentioned before that discrete traits are controlled by only one gene through single gene inheritance. Because continuous variation is more complicated, instead of getting a few distinct groups, you end up with a range of values. This is as a result of something called polygenic inheritance. So if we break this word down, which sometimes helps a lot in biology, poly means many and genic means genes. So these traits are controlled by many genes. So let us try some questions on what we've covered so far to check our knowledge before we move on. Pause the video here and try these questions either by saying them out loud or writing them down and when you're ready play the video and we'll go through the answers. Okay so the first question was to give the definition of a species. A group of organisms that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. It's really important you use the word interbreed and not just breed. What is continuous variation? Well, it's variation where there's a range of values between a minimum and a maximum. Give two examples of continuous variation. So any of the ones I spoke about. So anything from weight, height, hand span, foot length, that type of thing. What type of inheritance leads to continuous variation? Well, that's polygenic inheritance. What is discrete variation? Well, it's variation where measurements fall into distinct groups. Give two examples, would be anything from blood group, earlobes attached or unattached, tongue rolling ability, anything along those lines. And finally, what type of inheritance leads to discrete variation? Single gene. So the first thing we need to do before we move on to common questions is understand all the genetic terms that can be used in papers. There's a lot of new words here, so you'll have to take your time and pause the video and rewind when you need to. You must understand these terms before you move on to monohybrid crosses and Punnett squares, as otherwise you won't be able to understand what the question is asking you to do. So to explain all of these new terms, I'm going to use some examples to put the terms in context. The first example I'm going to use is pea plant flowers. So pea plant flowers can be either white in colour or pink in colour. Genes control this inherited characteristic. So our first new term is alleles. So alleles are different forms of a gene. Different alleles result in different variations of characteristics. So in this example, the gene is for flower colour, and this gene has two alleles or forms of the gene, pink and white. Now we discussed in a previous video how most cells in an organism can be described as diploid. This means that cells contain two matching sets of chromosomes in their nucleus. So in humans, our cells have 46 chromosomes in their nucleus. Organisms get one set of chromosomes from each parent, so we get 23 chromosomes from our mum and 23 from our dad. Each chromosome has a partner which contains the same genes. So there are actually two copies of the gene in pea plants for flower colour. One that the plant got from one parent and one that it got from the other. These genes can be different alleles or forms of the gene, so they can be white or pink in this case. So how do we write these alleles out? Well, we use capital letters or small letters to represent these alleles instead of writing pink or white each time. And these alleles should all use the same letter. So instead of using P for pink and W for white, we use just P. So I'm going to use the letter, letter P here. And um, so I'll use the letter P with a capital P, meaning pink, and lowercase p, or little p, for white. So I could say this flower on the right has two alleles, and these are big P and big P. So they're both pink alleles. So this flower um, over here has two pink alleles, big P and big P. Big P, big P is what we call the flower's genotype. So the alleles the organism possesses for that gene. However, the flower is actually pink. That's what we see when we look at it. So we can't see that it has two alleles and that they are both big P or pink. We can just see that the flower is pink, which is what we call the phenotype. So the phenotype of an organism is its physical appearance. And this physical appearance is as a result of the organism's genotype or alleles that it possesses. The picture down on the right shows some examples. So the two chromosomes on the left have a lot of bands or genes, and these can contain different alleles. This is the genotype of the organism, 
and this codes for the phenotype, which is what the organism looks like or its physical appearance. So this is a slightly different flower now. It still has a pink phenotype, like the example on the previous slide. So it looks pink, but instead of its genotype being big P, big P, its genotype is big P, little p. Finally, this flower is white, so that's its phenotype, and its genotype, so the alleles it possesses, are little p, little p. So now we've seen the three different genotypes the pea plant flowers can have from flower colour. Let's think why the flower with the genotype big P, little p is not white. We know that big P was pink and little p was white. So these two make sense on either side. The one on the left is big P, big P, so it's pink. This one's little p, little p, so it's white. But the flower in the middle has an allele of each one. So it's got big P, little p. So why is the flower in the middle not white? And why is it not even a mix of the two colours? Well, this is because pink was the dominant characteristic. Any allele which is dominant is always expressed even if it's present, it's just present in the genotype once. So even though the flower has only one big P allele, the one little p allele, the big p allele is always going to be dominant. So the phenotype's always pink, and that's why we represented pink as the capital letter, because it's the dominant one. The white allele is what we call recessive. This means you only see this phenotype if both of the alleles are recessive. So in the example on the right, there was only two little peas, there was no big P, so the flower was white. So in this example, the pink allele was dominant and the white allele was recessive. The final two terms you need to know are homozygous and heterozygous. These are both words which can be used to describe genotypes. So we can use these to describe genotypes so the alleles the organism possesses and not the phenotype or physical appearance. So homo means the same and hetero means different. So homozygous means the two alleles in the genotype are the exact same. So here this genotype, so big P, big P, is homozygous as they are both big P. On the right, this genotype can be described as homozygous as well because both of the alleles are little p. However, this example in the middle um, cannot be described as homozygous as it's two different alleles. One is big P, one is little p, so it's described as heterozygous instead. So homozygous, both alleles in the genotype are the same. Heterozygous, both alleles in the genotype are different. Now that's a lot of information and a lot of new terms and definitions. So let's have a look at one more different example of these terms in action. So now we're moving away from pea plant flowers and we're going to look at flies instead. In flies, there are two alleles or forms of the gene for body colour. Grey, which is big G, and black, which is little g. In this example, grey is dominant to black. So if any fly has a big G allele, then it's going to be grey. The black allele, um, little g, is recessive, so the fly has to have two of these in its genotype to show black in its phenotype. Remember the letters or the alleles the organism possesses, um, the organism's genotype, and the physical appearance of the organism is its phenotype, so black or grey. So this fly on the left's genotype is big G, big G, and so that means that this is going to be grey. The fly in the middle's genotype is big G, little g, so although it has one allele for black and one for grey, we know the grey is dominant, so the phenotype of this fly will be grey. Finally, the last fly on the right has a genotype of little g, little g, so both are black, which means the phenotype is black. Our last term we need to be able to use in this context is homozygous and heterozygous. The first and the third fly genotypes can be described as homozygous, as both alleles are identical. The fly on the left has a genotype of big G, big G, so they are the same, so homozygous dominant. And the fly on the right has the alleles little g, little g as its genotype, so its genotype is what we describe as homozygous recessive. The fly in the middle has one big G allele and one little g allele, so they are different, which means the fly is heterozygous. So let's try some quick questions on what we've covered so far to check our knowledge before we move on. So pause the video here and match each term to its meaning, either by saying the answer out loud or writing them down. And when you're ready, play the video and we'll go through the answers. Okay, so the first term was polygenic. Polygenic is the type of inheritance involving many genes acting together to control one characteristic. So a characteristic that's controlled by poly, which is many, genic, which is genes. <laughs> 
Number two is phenotype, and that matches with E, so the physical appearance expressed by an organism because of their genotype. Three is homozygous, which matches with D, so two alleles that are the same for the genotype. So for example, if A was our allele, it'd be big A, big A, or literally, literally, would be homozygous. Genotype is B, the set of alleles an organism possesses, so that's those letters. Five, recessive, goes with G, the form of a gene which will only be expressed if the genotype is homozygous. Um, heterozygous, for number six, goes with C, so two different alleles of a genotype, so big A, little A, or big B, little B. And finally, allele, so different forms of a gene. That's the one that comes up the most often where you get asked to give the definition. So now that we're familiar with all the genetic terms and meaning to this topic, we can now move on to putting these into practice. In National 5 level, you must be able to carry out something called a monohybrid cross. Although it sounds scary, it's actually quite simple as long as you follow the stages and lay it out properly. A monohybrid cross is a way of drawing out a cross between two individuals focusing on one single trait controlled by one gene, so a single gene inheritance. This means that all of the examples I'm going to use are of discrete variation, as continuous is too difficult. In a question on monohybrid crosses, you're usually given the parental generation, which we refer to as P, and are asked to work out the first generation of offspring, which we refer to as F1, or the second generation of offspring, which we refer to as F2. For our first example, we're going to focus on height in plants. So there are two different alleles or forms of this gene, tall or dwarf. Tall is dominant, therefore we're going to use big T for tall and small t for dwarf. Remember, it doesn't matter which letter you choose, although they'll normally tell you which one to use in the question. If you, they don't tell you, you can choose any letter you want, but I usually just use the first letter of the dominant allele, so in this case it would just be T for tall. So the first thing you do when you're setting out a monohybrid cross is you show the parents or the parental generation at the top. In a real question, you wouldn't draw the pictures, but this is just for an illustration to help. We're going to pretend that the question told us the genotypes for both parents. So this parent is big PT, big T, and this one is little t, little t. And they've asked us to work out the offspring produced in the F2 generation. So the phenotype of this parent is tall and this parent is short. The next thing we do is work out which gametes each parent could potentially pass on to their offspring. So our left-hand parent um, has a genotype of big T, big T, so he can only possibly pass on a big T allele to its offspring. The parent plant on the right has a genotype of little t, little t, so again can only pass, possibly pass on a little t allele to their offspring. They can't pass on a big T allele because they don't have it. Remember, the offspring get two copies of each gene, one from each parent. So under the gametes, I can now say at the bottom the genotype and phenotype of any offspring produced from those parents. This is my F1 generation. All will get a big T from this parent and all will get a little t from this parent. So that means that all of the offspring in the F1 generation will have the genotype big T, little t. And because of this fact, we know that tall is dominant, all of the offspring are going to be tall. Sometimes the question gets you to stop at this stage and this is your final answer. However, sometimes they ask you to carry on and go to the F2 generation instead, so the next generation along. What happens next is two of the offspring from this first generation are taken and are crossed together. So we take two of the ones at the bottom. So all that's happened here um, is I've taken two of the offspring from the F1, both of which are tall and have a genotype of big T, little t, and I've put them at the top as the parents. We then do a similar thing than what we did before. This parent plant on the left can only pass on his gametes, so either big T or little t. The other parent on the right is the exact same. Its genotype is big T, little t, so it can pass on either a big T or a little t. Remember, the offspring get a mixture of one from one, this parent and one from the other. Now, this time it's a little bit different from the last time. This is now a bit more complicated because fertilisation of gametes is random. We now need to work out the chance of each gamete coming together. So to make this easier, we use something called a Punnett square. To do this, we draw the following table that's at the bottom of the slide. We then take one of the sets of gametes and put them down the left-hand side, and we take the other set of gametes and we put them along the top. 
It doesn't matter which way around these go, but the two gametes have to stay together. So these two can go down the left or up the top. These two can go down the left or up the top. It doesn't matter, but they have to stay together. Then in the middle of the table, which is here in red, basically you then have to work out the gametes. So to do this, I read along the row and down the column for each square. So for this box, if I read along the row, it's big T. And if I read up down my column, it's big T as well. So big T, big T is this box. For this box over here, if I read along, it's big T. If I read up, it's little T. I always put the big T first. So big T, little T. For this one down here, if I read along, it was little T. If I read up, it was big T. So big T, little T. And for this final one, I read along and I read up and it's little t, little t for both. Once my Punnett square has been filled in, though, that's not me finished. I have to interpret my results. Now, your final answer for this question depends on what was asked. They can either ask you for the genotype or the phenotype of the F2 offspring. And within each of those categories, they can ask you to lay it out as a ratio or as a percentage. So we'll go through all of the options here, but don't write this every time, just when the question what the question asks for. So let's imagine the question asks for the answer as a phenotypic ratio. So we're going to start here. Phenotypic ratio just means ratio of the different phenotypes to one another. Now we know in this example there were two phenotypes, tall and dwarf. You should also know a ratio is a number, two numbers at least, separated by a colon. To get the numbers, we must use our Punnett square. So out of our four possible offspring, we have to now work out the phenotypic ratio. Okay, so in this example here, we can try and work out what the ratio would be. So to get the numbers, we use the table. Well, basically, out of these four possible offspring in red, how many would have a tall phenotype? Well, there are three that have big T and one that doesn't. So we knew that big T means tall, so there's three big T's. So in my phenotypic ratio, I write three tall, colon, one dwarf, because this one doesn't have a big T, so it's going to be a dwarf phenotype. So my final answer, if they ask me for a phenotypic ratio for my question, is three tall to one dwarf. Now let's imagine instead of phenotypic ratio, they ask for a phenotypic percentage instead. Let's imagine these four offspring make up 100%, so each one's worth 25 what percent would be tall? Well, this Punnett square tells me that three out of the four would be tall, so that's 75%. So that means 25% would be dwarf. So if I was to write it as a percentage instead, I would say 75% would be tall, 25% would be dwarf. So now let's imagine that instead of phenotype, they ask me about genotype instead. So let's say they ask for the genotypic ratio of the F2 generation. So looking at my Punnett square, um, it's a bit harder this time. So there's not just two phenotypes, there's three genotypes this time. So having we look, there's big T, big T, there's big T, little t, and there's little t, little t. So what we have to do is we now need to work out how many of each there is. So my genotypic ratio would be one big T, big T, to two big T, little t, to one little t, little t. So remember to separate your ratio with colons like you can see at the bottom. Finally, they would ask for the genotypes but as a percentage and not a ratio. So out of 100%, 25% would be big T, little, big T, 50% would be big T, little T, and 25% would be little T, little T. So you, it depends on what the question asks for, which one of those four that you give. Now, you'll never need to draw the diagrams or full layout of a monohybrid cross, and sometimes the question only wants you to go as far as the F1 and not the F2. Also, you need to look carefully at what type of answer they want. Do they want a ratio or a percentage, and do they want the genotype or the phenotype? So we're going to go through some more worked examples, be using a quicker layout and some proper questions so you can see how they might word it. So our first example question is, predict the percentage of each genotype produced in the F2 generation from the monohybrid cross of a long-tailed cat, which is big H, big H, with a short-tailed cat, which is little h, little h. So from here, I can pick out what I need to do. So I need to go all the way to my F2 generation, and my answer should be a genotypic percentage. I also have both parents' genotypes to start off with in blue as well. So this is the short way to lay out the answer to this question. So P for parental generation at the top, 
I got both of these from the question. So this parent has a genotype big H little H, or big H, big H, sorry, and is long tailed. And it's its phenotype. So long tailed is dominant. The other parent has little H, little H as their genotype, and their phenotype is short tailed. I then work out the gametes these parents could pass on. So the one on the left could pass on just big H, and the one on the right can only pass on little H. So my F1 generation is nice and easy because I can only have a big H and a little H together. So all of my F1 generation have to be big H, little H. And because big H is dominant, all of them are long tailed. I can't, can't stop there though, as I need to get to the F2 generation for the final answer. So I take two of these F1 cats and I breed them together. So this one can pass on again, big H or a little H this time. And this one can pass on a big H or a little H. Now this is obviously a bit more confusing, so I have to use my Punnett square to work it out. So I draw my square and I put one set of gametes on the left and one set of gametes along the top. And then for each box, I work out my genotype. And you can see my answers in red at the bottom. Now I need my final answer and the question asks for the genotypic percentage. So for our ones here, um, out of the four, so 25% were big H, big H, 50% were big H, little H, and 25% were little h, little h. So that is my final answer. So now we're going to try one more example together before you try some yourself. So in this example, it says a heterozygous wrinkled pea was crossed with a smooth pea. What percentage of the offspring will be wrinkled? So there's a few differences here to our last example. We haven't explicitly been given the genotypes of the parents, but we can work them out in a minute. At the end, I want to know the percentage that will be wrinkled and we don't want to know all the percentages. So the phenotypic percentage, and it says I only have to get to the F1 generation, so I only have to do one cross. The first thing I need to do, though, is to work out the parent's genotype so I can actually start the cross. So it says heterozygous wrinkled P was crossed with a smooth P. Well, if the P is heterozygous, it must have one big allele and one small allele. So one big allele, one small allele. So it has to be big W, little w. And because it looks wrinkled, it means wrinkled has to be dominant. So I'm going to use W as my letter. So its genotype is going to be dig, big W, little w, because it's heterozygous, but we know it's wrinkled. So it has to have a dominant. The other parent has smooth peas. So we know that smooth is recessive. So we'll only see that phenotype if both alleles are smooth or recessive. So it must be little w, little w. If it had a big W, then this P wouldn't be smooth, it would be wrinkled. So now we have the parent's genotypes, we're ready to start the cross. So the parent generation, so I put P um, over here, and basically we have genotypes big W, little w, and little w, little w. And we got that from understanding the terms used in the wording of the question. That's why those terms are so important. So the first thing we have to do is work out the gametes. So this parent can pass on either big W or little w, and this one can only pass on little w or little w. So again, we take these and we put them into a Punnett square. So we take two of them, the gametes, and we put them along the top, and we take the other two and we put them down the side. Remember, it doesn't matter which way round you put these. So once we've done them, we can work out what goes in each box, which I've done in red here. So remember, you read along and down, along and up along and up and along and up and that will give you your answers for each one. Now our question only asks for the F1 offspring so we can stop here and it also asks what percentage of them would be wrinkled. So we just want a percentage of how many would have had the wrinkled phenotype. So if we look at our four potential offspring we're looking for the ones that have a capital W because we know that that's dominant and that's wrinkled and we can see here that out of the four Two of them have a big W, so that's 50% of the offspring that would be wrinkled. So my final answer is just 50%. So now it's time for you to try one of these questions yourself. So pause the video here, work out the answers to this two-part question, and when you're ready, play the video and we'll go through the answers. Okay, so for this one, there's two parts to this question. If fly's eye colour is controlled by a single gene, red eyes are dominant to black eyes, what would be the predicted ratio of dominant to recessive phenotypes in a cross between, and we'll just do this first one, so two heterozygotes, okay? So first thing we know is that red eyes are dominant to black, so I'm probably going to use R as being my um, letter. So capital R for red, 
little r for black. I want to finish with a ratio of dominant to recessive, okay? And it doesn't say anything about going to the F2 generation, so I can just stop at F1. So what I would do is I would take the um, ones here, so two heterozygotes. So heterozygotes mean that they have a big R and a little r. So two heterozygotes I've got here. They're both going to be red because red's dominant. This one can pass on a big R or a little r, and this one can also pass on a big R or a little r. I then do my Punnett square, so I take two of my gametes and put them down the side, two of my gametes, put them along the top, and then work out my four boxes in the middle. The question asks what would be the predicted ratio of dominant to recessive phenotypes? So phenotype is red and white, so there would be three dominant, so three red to one white. So three to one or three red to one white is my final answer. The second question said, what would the predicted ratio of dominant to recessive phenotypes, so again, we're doing dominant to recessive as a ratio, in a heterozygote and a homozygous individual? So let's have a wee look. So heterozygote, so big R, little r, and a homozygous recessive individual, so that'd be little r, little r. So this one would be black, this one would be red. This one can pass on a big R or a little r, and this parent can pass on a little r or a little r. Again, put my table, so big R and little r go along here, little r and little r go down the side, fill in my squares, and I need to make sure I'm answering my question. So I want to know the do ratio of dominant to recessive phenotypes. So in this example here, I would have two that were red, and I would have two that are um, black here. So my final answer has to be two red um, to two black, or one red to one black, because I can then shorten my ratio down. Two to two isn't correct because it's not the simplest whole number. Now there's a wee mistake down here. It should be one red to one black for this one. Okay. So next we want to look at whether the answers given by Punnett squares and monohybrid crosses are actually always true in real life. So earlier we used the example of pea plant flowers either having a phenotype of pink or white, as this characteristic is controlled by a single gene. So if I took this trait and did a monohybrid cross of the two parents who were homozygous for their allele through to the F2 um, generation, so they were homozygous parents um, and then crossed them all the way through to the F2 generation, this is what the results would look like. Out of every four, three would be pink and one would be white. So that is our predicted results if we went through this as normal. So three pink to one white. However, in real life, this is the result from a textbook, the actual results were 705 offspring were pink to 224 being white. So this is a really common exam question for this topic. Why were the predicted and actual phenotypic ratios not the same? So we can see that here, predicted ratio is different from the actual. So you still give the same answer every time. You always say it's because fertilisation is a random process. If we go back one slide here and have a look, each parent produced two types of gametes, one with each allele, okay? And whatever, whichever pollen fertilizes the ovulum plants or the sperm that fertilizes the egg in animals is random chance. So which is why the predicted and the actual ratios are different from each other. So if you're asked why the predicted and the actual ratios in a monohybrid cross might be different, it's because fertilization is a random process. So let's try some quick questions on what we've covered so far to check our knowledge before we move on. These are all true or false questions, so for each you have to decide if the statement is true or false. If it's false, give the word you would replace the underlined word with to make the statement true. So pause the video here and try the questions, either by saying them out loud or writing them down, and when you're ready, play the video and we'll go through the answers. Okay. So the first one said, a characteristic shows continuous variation if it can be used to divide up members of a species into distinct groups. That is not true, it's false, and it's discrete variation that's used to put them into distinct groups. Foot length in humans is an example of continuous variation. That's true because there's a range of values between a minimum and a maximum for foot length. Physical characteristics such as coat colour make up an organism's phenotype. That is true. An allele that is masked by the dominant form is said to be inferior. That's false, we've not used the word inferior before, it's recessive instead. The genotype Big H Big H can be described as heterozygous dominant. Not true, 
um, this would be homozygous dominant because they're both the same, not different. The term used to describe a characteristic which is controlled by more than one gene is polygenic. That's true. Poly means many, genic means genes. So the final thing you need to be able to do in this topic is to identify both phenotypes and genotypes from family trees using all of the information we've learned about genetics so far. Now there is a simple process that I like to teach to help to make sure you can work out any answer. For these examples we're going to try and fill in every phenotype and genotype for every individual in the family tree. However, in a test or exam, they would never ask you to do that. They would only ask you about certain individuals and you would have to work them out. But it is really, really good practice just to do them all for now until you get used to it and get the hang of it. Now, the first thing to point out is that working out an individual phenotype from a family tree is really easy. Any family tree in a test or exam will be colour coded by phenotype. So here on the right hand side, there will usually be a key. That key says any individual shaded in black has free earlobes um, and any in white has fixed earlobes. So if a question asked um, to give the phenotype, for example, for person R, we know right away they're shaded in black, so their phenotype is free earlobes. Um, and we know if, for example, if we're asked about person S, well, they're white, so fixed earlobes. So phenotype questions from family trees are really easy. You basically just look at the key and read off the colour. What's more difficult is working out the genotypes of each individual. The easiest way to do this is to go through three stages. The first stage is fill in all of the homozygous recessive individual genotypes first. So at the top, it says that free earlobes are dominant to fixed earlobes. So that means that if someone has fixed earlobes, then they must have the genotype little e, little e. So that's the first thing we can do. We can go through all of the fixed earlobe individuals and write little e, little e, because there's no other genotype that they can possibly have. So I've done that here in red. This is always the first stage because these are the ones you can guarantee. So here you see for each homozygous recessive individual, so those with fixed earlobes, I've written little e, little e. The next thing to do is fill in the other individuals in the family tree with one dominant letter. This is because all of them definitely have free earlobes, all of the ones in black, so we know they have to have at least one capital E or one big E. So besides everyone else, I've written one big E, which you can see here in green. So that's our second stage. The final stage is to fill in the blank alleles for these individuals. You need to do this based on the fact that each offspring has to get one of their alleles from each parent which means you can use the parents to work out the genotypes of the offspring or use the offspring genotypes to work out the parents. So for example, if we look at person R, I know they have to have at least one biggie because they have free earlobes, but is their genotype biggie biggie or biggie little Well, to find out, I look at the offspring. So the offspring has a genotype little e, little e, and they must have gotten one of each of these little e's from each parent. So got one little e from this parent, but they must have also got one from this parent over here. So that means person R had to have at least one little e to be able to pass it on to them. So they have to be big e, little e. It's the exact same situation for the person here on the bottom right. So person S down here. This means they definitely have, um, or this one over here, sorry. So they have definitely got one big e um, because they have free earlobes. But then we also have to think, right, do, do they have a big e or a little e as their other allele? Well, if we look at their offspring, their offspring has two little e's. So again, they must have had one so that they could pass the other little e onto their offspring. If this parent was big e, big e, then the offspring would have three earlobes and would have at least one big e because that would be all they could pass on to them. So now let's have a try of this other example. So this one here, straight thumb um, big T is dominant to hitchhiker's thumb, which is little t. There's also a reminder at the bottom left of the stages you should be following. So fill in all the homozygous recessive individuals first, then fill in one dominant letter for everyone else, and then work out the second allele for everyone else based on the parents or offspring that are shown. So pause the video here and give this a try, and then play when you're ready to go through the answers. So I'm just going to go through each of the stages explaining our thinking. So in the first stage here, we put little t, little t beside each person that is hitchhiker's thumb, because hitchhiker's thumb is recessive. So if they have hitchhiker's thumb, they only can have the genotype little t, little t. Then in stage two, I put a big T next to every other individual because they have to have at least one big T because they have straight thumbs. Finally, I work out the letter based, other letter, the other allele, based on the parents or offsprings of the genotypes round about them, 
So all of these ones are pretty simple. If we look at person A, for example, up here, they have offsprings that have little t, little t. So these are four offspring. So the, although they have some that are mixed, they have some that are little t, little t. If there are any that are little t, little t, they must have got one t, little t from one parent and one little t from the other. So both parents have to have one little t. Okay. However, there is other ones that are a bit more tricky that we should point out. So person B down here. So we don't know person B's offspring. There's no offspring under them here. So all we know is their parents. We know they must have one big telial as they have a straight thumb. However, they could have got that from either parent and from either parent they could have got a big T or they could have got a little T as well. So we basically can't tell whether they're big T, big T or big T, little T because we can't tell from the parents and they have no offspring there. So for this answer, I would need to put both. So sometimes they can put in a tricky one like this if there isn't actually possible to decide between two genotypes and because there isn't enough information. But for everyone else, we can work it out. So let's try one final example of this. So pause the video here and work out all of the genotypes and then play and we'll answer the questions. Okay, so if you manage to fill this in correctly, then here's the answers. There's one tricky one in here too. So Liz down here can either be big H, big H, or big H, little H. We can't tell which again. So basically for each of these, we should have gone through and put our little H, little H is first, and then we should have done big H beside everyone else, and then use the parents or the offsprings to work out which of the two possible dominant alleles they could have. So could they have big H, big H, or big H, little H as their genotype? If you didn't get any of these right, feel free to go back and watch the last few minutes again and retry the other examples, as I know this is a really difficult concept, but the only way to get better at it is to practice. So that's us finished learning about variation and inheritance. For this part, I hope that you can now compare discrete and continuous variation, understand various genetic terms, including allele, genotype, phenotype, dominant, recessive, homozygous, heterozygous. Hopefully you can now carry out a monohybrid cross from parent generation down to F2. And I'm hoping you can finally explain the reasons why predicted phenotype ratios among offspring are not always achieved. Remember, fertilisation is a random process. Please feel free to go back and watch parts of this video again in the future if you need a refresher on this topic. Thank you once again for listening.